again and again. We arrive at Holy Week, today this Palm Sunday, which is also our Passion Sunday. We begin the slow, steady journey to the cross together. But it's important to know also to remember where we've come from this Lenten season. Again and again, let's be reminded now through artwork of where we were and how we've arrived. Just before things got started, there was the trip up the mountain, Jesus and four of his disciples, and that bizarre, bewildering transfiguration through which the early followers could catch a glimpse of the magnificentness of the divine. Then we were invited in on Ash Wednesday, again and again to journey in the wilderness with Jesus, 40 days and 40 nights. Again and again, we were reminded God meets us and the bow in the sky, the rainbow, encouraged us to make a covenant too like God's and cast aside this Lent any behaviors that keep us from healthy relationships with one another. Again and again, we see the cross, a reminder that we are called to listen to Jesus, even as he predicted a hard truth, that he would suffer, be rejected, be killed, but rise again. Through it all, we are shown the way, even if that way means turning over the tables of oppression, standing with the marginalized or upsetting the norms, just as Jesus did. Yet it fuels us to recall again and again, God loves first. For God so loved that we can then live out that love in the here and now. And out of God's sacred nourishing love, along the way again and again, we are reformed by God to be even more generous, compassionate, truthful, justice oriented. So this is how we've traveled so far. And we know the journey of Holy Week is just beginning. We'll start with the pomp and pageantry of Palm Sunday. And very quickly during this worship service, we will feel the cool night air set in on Jesus's last night, the last supper and into the goings on of Friday. And so sit tight, open up your hearts, and let us now worship the God of Holy Week. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for three hundred denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. forward for children's time. Help me tell the story, will you? We just heard the story of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. They were all friends of Jesus and they were gathered together. Jesus was there too. And Mary did a strange thing. Did you hear what she did? She took perfume that she had and she rubbed it all over Jesus's body. She made sure that from the top of his head to the tippy, his tippy toes, that he was covered in this perfume and it filled up the whole house. Hmm, why do you think she did this? It's 
not every day that we rub perfume on our friends, right? So why? Why do you think she did that? Hmm, maybe this has something to do with it. Do you remember how Jesus died on the cross? So what Mary was doing with the perfume is she was getting his body ready for when he would die. And that's the story that we're telling today. Jesus dying on the cross. But we know that God does a lot. God is a God of hope. And the story doesn't end today. We'll have to come back next week and hear how it does truly end. But for now, I invite you to grab a hold of your palm branch that you've made, and I want you to wave it around and hoot and holler as Jesus comes into Jerusalem riding on a silly donkey. He comes in waving, and so I want you to do just the same. Now, I have a very big ask of you. Kids, I want you to help me hold this big, big, heavy offertory plate, and it's about to get heavier, so please put your hands out now. Help me hold it, okay? And I want you to, to throw in your praises to Jesus. Put that into the plate. That's your extravagant offering, just like that perfume was an offering to Jesus. And now keep holding it, okay? It's getting heavy, and I'm going to invite all of you adults, adults of everywhere I would invite you to now throw into the offertory your extravagant gifts of your time, your talent shared, hard-earned money that you're willing to share with the ministries of the church. Throw it in now because later we might get too distracted by how difficult the story turns. So now at a time where we are praising God and welcoming Jesus into Jerusalem, we welcome also your offerings. And so let us pray together. Kids keep holding because now I'm holding it with one hand, all right? Oh God, bless all that we give, all the praises to you, oh God, all the acts of welcome as Jesus enters Jerusalem this day. The artist writes, Jesus lies on the donkey's back, bracing himself for his journey through the palms, a target on his back. He's a disruption to the status quo, a threat to the power of the empire. His friend Lazarus is caught up in it all too. I imagine as Jesus closes his eyes and strokes the donkey's hair, he hears the anguish in Mary and Martha's voices as they cried out to him, wondering why he took so long to come to them in their time of need. I imagine Jesus smells the pungent fragrance of the burial perfume. I wonder if it brought back memories of their beautiful, extravagant offering, if it brings into a greater reality his impending death. Jesus plans to enter the city in a way that symbolically subverts power, taking a route in opposition to the military leaders who are overseeing the festival. His entrance on a donkey would make a definitive statement outlining an alternative kind of power, now a servant leader riding in on a donkey, a humble creature. This most certainly would inch him ever closer to the cross. I wonder if Jesus could feel his heartbeat in his throat the way I do when I'm afraid. I wonder if he had to take deep breaths in through his nose out through his mouth, tricking his body into a state of calm. I wonder if he was nauseous, like I am when I'm headed into a hard conversation. I wonder if he had to summon his courage, tucking away fear so that he could hold on to what mattered most with both hands. 
I wonder because time has taught us that is not uncommon for a peaceful protest to start or end with an unjust death. So I wonder, did he know? Was he afraid? Did anyone see it? I want to hold what matters most with both hands. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Hosanna, loud Hosanna, the little children say. Through pillared court and temple, the lovely anthem rang. To Jesus, who had blessed them, those folded to his breast. The children sang their praises, the palm branch waving and chanting clear and loud. The one whom angels worship rode on in lowly state, and glad to see the children slow down the donkey's gate. Hosanna in the highest that is and sing with all our powers. Hosanna, Christ, we praise you with heart and life and voice. Hosanna in your presence forever we'll There's a lot of pomp and pageantry today. The little children sing, us waving our palm branches together. But there is always a deeper message here today than just the lightness of a cutesy little parade. We have to remember what it is that Jesus is doing in town. Riding in on a donkey, he's leading a protest. A peaceful one at that and he is ushering in a new way even at the end of his life here he is standing laying claim to a vision that is different than the existence of the Empire here Jesus says that you should love one another serve one another be humbled here Jesus sides with those in the crowd who have the weakest voice, who can't express how they feel, who cannot share those who have been squashed repeatedly. And so in the midst of this palm parade today, we ask ourselves, what structures need upturning? In our society? How might we point a way that is very different than what the world looks like? What is our cause? We don't have to do everything and be all things to all people, but what is our cause as individuals, as families, as a community of faith? 
what particular way are we going to make an impact? Reverse course, do things drastically different. For that is what Jesus did. That's what he came in, not on a war horse, but rather on a humble donkey, expressing us to us again the call to the work of justice, standing on the side of the oppressed, feeding the hungry, quenching the thirst of those who need water. Is it children at the border? Our, Air, our Asian American friends who are victimized? Is it standing in solidarity with our Muslim siblings? Where is the justice that we will employ? How will we follow in the footsteps of Jesus, even the footsteps of a donkey? The closer and closer we get to the crucifixion, the more earnest our prayers of confession feel. For we know that what was done to Jesus, betrayal, humiliation, violence, and death, are things that we do to each other all the time. Let us confess together. Holy God, if I were to place myself at your table, I would probably be Peter misunderstanding your radical hospitality, sticking to the rules, arguing what I do and don't deserve. Then again, it's possible that I'd be Judas, the one who betrayed you, the one who failed to see the good right in front of him, the one who might have thought that he wasn't worthy of your love. If I were to place myself at your table, it's possible I would be one of the unnamed disciples, watching but not speaking, silently missing the opportunity to tell you what I believe and how much I love you. If I were to place myself at your table, I am confident I would have made the same mistakes as your disciples made. There is no surprise there. What is surprising is that I know you would have washed my feet nonetheless. So forgive me, God. Wash not just my feet, but my hands and my head also.
Jesus knew that Peter would deny. He knew that Judas would betray. And he knew the disciples would hide in fear. And still, and still, he invited them in. He washed their feet, and he fed them. No matter who we are, no matter where we go, no matter how great our mistakes or regrets are, in life. Again and again and again, we are forgiven. Again and again and again, we are held. Amen. The artist writes, The first time my dad took me to visit her in the hospital, I walked in to find a slouched figure sunken below a bundle of blankets, short brown hairs collected in clumps along her shoulders and pillowcase. A cotton beanie grasped the edges of her yellowing, swollen face. I averted my eyes at the sight, tricked by cancer's devouring disguise. Pale walls drained the room of energy. Even the blue curtains in the window drooped lethargically against the wall. As we came close, my mother's sunken torso grew. Her familiar, honey-riched voice filled like liquid in my ears. Take off your shoes. Let me rub your feet. I paused. Death pressed in on us like an unrelenting fog. I was scared unsure of how to play daughter to a mother whose life was slowly slipping away. Let me rub your feet. Reluctantly, I climbed up onto the hospital bed. Reaching through the blanketed layers, she removed my shoes. The sweat from my middle school basketball practice still lingering on my skin. Without hesitation, she peeled off my socks and gently massaged away the anxieties building within the room. In the face of cancer that would soon take her, my mother was determined to hold us close. In the fading and fullness of life, she savored moments of service to others. Her gentleness continues to startle and soothe me.
my body given for you. This is the cup that holds the blood of a new covenant. This is forgiveness, simple and true. This is the way that I have made for you. Before you eat, before you drink, take a long look inside and tell me what you see. He said, do this in remembrance of me. the bread of life broken for you. This is the cup that holds the wine of a new covenant. This is the love of Christ poured out anew. This is the Son of God who died for you. Before you And tell me what you see. Then do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. Again and again, we find ourselves here, where we've been before, a place of grieving, mourning, a night that won't end. Knee deep in fear and doubt, scripture tells us there was a lot of shouting that day. Take him away, crucify him, crowds shouted. In grief, Mary cried out. In pain, God cried out. 2,000 years later, we're still shouting. The world still filled with violence. The air so full of words, screams, hurt. So we quiet ourselves to hear the story again, to hear God again. Again and again, we find ourselves here. Our own artist-in-residence, Dave Nee, 
came across these words of scripture from a translation. In the piercing of Christ's side, a wound to his heart. Now she writes that she had heard so much about Christ's piercing by the soldiers, a physical piercing. But these words in the piercing of Christ's side, a wound to his heart, these helped her to focus now on the emotional piece of, of Jesus's death, a wound to his heart. As one who laid down his life for his beliefs, his heart, she writes, must have been broken and continued to break. So she created this, the broken heart with the nails piercing it. Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head and dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is your man. The chief priest shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. They answered, According to the law, he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. 
Pilate brought Jesus outside. It was the day of preparation for the Passover, about noon. He said, here is your king. The crowds cried out, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked, shall I crucify your king? They answered, we have no king but the emperor. Then he handed Jesus over to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to Golgotha, the place of the skull. There they crucified him and with two others on either side and Jesus in between them. Pilate had an inscription written and put on the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic and said, Let us cast lots for it, to see who will get it. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopius, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. We believe in the long night of the soul, the spaces and times when despair weighs on us like a blanket. We believe those seasons of life are real and that every one of us experiences them. We refuse to believe that pain and suffering hold the last word. For we believe in Jesus of Nazareth, whose narrative didn't stop here at the foot of the cross knee-deep in despair, face to face with pain. So we wait here, and we linger, and we hope, and we believe. They crucified our Lord yeah, they never said a mumbled word. They crucified our Lord. Yeah, they never said a mumbled word. Not a word. Not a word. Not a word. They nailed him to a tree. Yeah, they never said a mumbled word. They nailed him to a tree Yeah, they never said a mumbled word Not a word, not a word Not a word They pierced him in his side Yeah, they never said a mumbled word They pierced him in his side Yet he never said a mumbled word, not a word, not a word, not a word. He bowed his head and died. Yet he never said a mumbled word. He bowed his head and died. Yet he never said a mumbled word, not a word. Not a word, not.